Um, doing the work in many areas has become more challenging because the way um, SARS-CoV-2 has been reported has not only created distrust, I mean, I think every bat research has been called every name under the sun from being called a Russian spy to a CPC puff piece. Mm. And yeah, I've, I've been called both of those hmm. because doing this kind of work in China is difficult. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson here again. I hope you've had a fantastic week and you've got a brilliant weekend planned. Two recent publications in the journal Science established a strong body of evidence that the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic started at the Huanan market in Wuhan, most likely in November, and via at least two zoonotic jumps from intermediate host animals into humans, seeding the emergence of two early lineages that would manage to establish human-to-human -human transmission chains. However, while there's strong scientific consensus that the pandemic started with zoonotic spillover, many open questions remain as to what exactly happened upstream of the market. Did zoonosis really happen at the market? Where did infected animals or potentially infected wildlife traders come from? And where is the original reservoir of SARS-CoV-2? To get a better understanding of these upstream processes, we invited Professor Alice Hughes. Professor Hughes completed her PhD in bat ecology at the University of Bristol with fieldwork in Thailand before doing postdocs in Thailand and Australia. She then moved to China to work in Yunnan for the Chinese Academy of Sciences for almost a decade and led a research group with a special focus on bat ecology and biogeography across Asia. She now works as an associate professor at the University of Hong Kong. Alice has had an incredibly adventurous career, with her first research trip to the Peruvian rainforest being at the age of 17. Today, her work focuses on patterns of biodiversity and drivers of biodiversity change, where she looks at various spatio-temporal scales in order to develop proactive management strategies that aim to mitigate the impacts of human activities on biodiversity. Her research spans from biogeographic research to conservation prioritization and management, with a special focus on critical ecosystems, including cave and car systems, and especially bats. Alice has been studying bats, their reservoirs, roosting, and migration behavior for almost a decade using an integrated approach involving predictive, empirical and molecular approaches to gain a more holistic understanding of the processes underlying present biodiversity patterns. She recently also published a paper together with other members from the Chinese Academy of Science, pinpointing the genetic origin of SARS-CoV-2 in Southeast Asia, an area she is quite familiar with. So who better to talk to regarding the possible upstream events that led to the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. All right, so welcome, Alice. Thank you very much for joining our podcast. So first and foremost, you know, why don't you explain a little bit of your life trajectory? Because you had an amazing life. You're also a very unusual life. And, and just, you know, give our listeners a bit of an overview of what you do for a living. <laughs> Uh, okay, so hello everyone listening. Um, I'm a conservation biologist. I've been working in the Australasian region for about the last 14 years now. I grew up in the rural UK and always knew that I wanted to work on biodiversity conservation. Um, as an undergraduate, I went to the tropics to work in various parts of the tropics every year and ended up one summer doing bat work in a remote part of Borneo, which basically got me on a bat track. Um, <laughs> and so my PhD research was based in Southern Thailand, working on the conservation biogeography of Southeast Asian bats. Then I moved to Thailand, then Australia, then spent almost a decade working in mainland China on bats and other things before moving to Hong Kong at the end of last year. So now you have a research group in Hong Kong. Um, yep. 
how how many people uh, and you is it is it like a field work group you you travel out into the cost region doing field work well, we're or? trying to sort that getting permits for a new group in a pandemic is a bit tricky yeah I can but understand. when i was working in mainland china we had weekly sampling for about five years within um our institute which had large patches of forest in it and we also did field work all across southeast asia so lots of sites in myanmar and vietnam some in um Malaysia, and of course, lots in Thailand, stemming from our former work there. So, so one yeah. one question that jumps jumps out for me straight away is: Are bats fairly ubiquitous? Because obviously, we have you know we have them in the UK here. You talked about a lot of different places you've been. Are, are they pretty much everywhere in the world? The ubiquity of bats—that's never an expression I thought I'd hear. <laughs> um, bats are the second biggest mammal group. So, there's about one thousand four hundred species. They're on every non glaciated continent, but the most species are in tropical regions. Mm. So within my old institute, we had about 42 species of bat, which is quite a lot. And they regularly make up more than half the mammals in tropical environments. Wow. So that makes a bit more sense if we have this dimension to know, okay, there's probably a lot of viruses circulating in them, also given that they live in huge colonies. And, yeah. and well, but I mean, bats are awesome <laughs> animals. Um, so basically having a um, fast paced life means that every part of their bodies have to be optimized to being able to withstand things that would kill other mammals. So a bat's basal metabolism can accelerate up to 16 times the basal rate and that generates a huge amount of heat. And so if it was a human, we'd basically fry all our cells. And so because of that, every cell in their body is basically optimized to be able to withstand things that would kill any other mammal cell. And so physiologically, they work in a different way to any other mammal species. And that's why a five gram bat can live 40 years in the wild. So about this is, yeah, this is one, one thing when I, when I look for bats, it's so weird that they live so long. I mean, usually, Ooh, yeah. you know, if you compare mice, right, and they are genetically super far apart, right? We are closer to bats than mice are to a certain extent. Yeah, uh, well... Yeah. I mean, humans are in the same major clade as the rodents, whereas bats' yeah. nearest neighbors are things like dolphins and pigs. Um, <laughs> Philip is just biased. Philip, Philip is just biased because the German is flayed a mouse, flying mouse. So he, he, yeah, yeah, exactly. For me, it's always like I thought it's just a, 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 a rat with wings, you know. <laughs> but better than chauve souris, which basically means bald mouse, which is the French word for bats. <laughs> Fair enough. I didn't know that. So can you can you just explain because you know people might not be aware that bats fulfill you know a lot of critical function in ecosystems and I think this is also why you have such a strong focus as an as an um, uh, conservation biologist in bats as keystone species so maybe you can uh, explain a little bit about what bats do that is so important for ecosystems yeah so bats of course as you said fulfill a huge number of important ecosystem services that includes of course uh, pest control some bats can eat one and a half times their body weight per night in insects and that will include uh pests of various crop types it will include disease vectors like mosquitoes but it also includes seed dispersal and pollination and in major ecosystems like savanna systems with baobabs or uh, deserts with sanguaro cactus or areas with eucalyptus they're actually some of the main pollinator species mm -hmm. and in island systems sometimes those are the animals that maintain the ecosystem integrity because bats can fly between islands and pollinate and spread seeds and so within those systems especially those small islands some of the tree species would not be viable unless there were actually bats fulfilling those important services. Wow, that's crazy because, I mean, trees in themselves are, you know, huge for, you know, ecosystems. And if you, if you, if you cannot grow a certain amount of certain trees, then whole ecosystems collapse. So, and if the bats have a critical role in that alone, it's a huge impact. Wow. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, some of those species are going to be things like figs, which are in themselves keystone species. Yeah. But also if we're thinking about forest recovery following mm -hmm. something like deforestation, a large bat is going to fly over a larger open area than many fruit eating birds, meaning that sometimes those first seeds that become the new regenerating forest got there because they got there in a bat's gut or were dropped by a bat as they flew over carrying the fruit in their mouth. So they're basically pollinators, <laughs> insect uh, killers. Yeah. So we should have some bats in our apartment. You know, it's like you know, don't get spiders, get bats. It's way better, or maybe I mean, not. Yeah, I, I would not be adverse to that. Um, 
we had bats, of course, in my roof when I was growing up. A lot of people do, even in urban mm. environments. And I think that people are not aware that often the most diverse mammals in a city are going to be the bat species mm. because they cohabit our spaces with us. And often we're not aware that they're even there. And so being more aware of our neighbours of all types is important because they do fulfil these important services and they get a lot of bad rap when actually they don't deserve it. Why do you think that is? Yeah, uh, that leads on to that that question, like Philip says. Why do you think people find them so scary and ugly? Is it is it this association with, you know, they hide in dark places, they come out at night, we don't see them. They drink our blood. Yeah, all these kind of... Yeah. There's only three species of bat that feed on <laughs> blood, and they don't normally feed on human blood. Um, I think we're very scared of being... Uh, well, I think we're very good at being scared of things that we don't know much about. Hmm. And the best way to combat fear is information. So when people learn more about them, they realize just how fascinating they are and how actually our mental image of a bat, which people may imagine to be like a flying rodent, just isn't the case. Mm. Um, some of them, of course, have huge eyes and they look very cute. Um, some of the flying foxes are often known as mm. sky puppies. Um, and of That's course, cute. they're not all black. You have yeah. orange and black bats. You have white bats with 1,420 or so species to choose from before we consider the cryptic species, mm. there's a massive amount of diversity. And even if we think about how distinct they are, there are two major lineages of bats um, and they diverged somewhere around maybe 63, 65 million years ago. Like when our human ancestors, well, uh, early primate ancestors diverged from the Tarsiers. So, we're talking a very, very large amount of time here. And despite the fact we call them one group um, because they are the only mammals with powered flight, it's like considering both the primates and the prosimians. So it's a very diverse group of very different animals. You you sent a paper around about the cryptic species within bats. Maybe you can uh, say a bit more. This is fascinating. So there is there's actually a lot we don't know about the diversity Absolutely. within species we, of, of bats, right? Yeah. So for some of the major clades, we've probably described 40 or 50 percent of species. And I think a lot of people think, well, we, we've discovered most species, right? Slow rates of species discovery now. But actually, the fact we have new tools now means that we can have a much greater understanding of species distribution than we ever had before. Now, some of these are going to be species that we missed because they look similar. Um, but vision isn't that useful for most bats. So the fact that we're using these very visual cues means that for species that rely on something different, like in the case of bats, auditory cues might not be very reliable. And it's also important when we're conserving species, because if you don't know how many species there are or where those species are, obviously you can't target protection towards them. But also in terms of things like zoonotic risk, if you have two species of bat in the cave or 10 species of bat in the cave, it kind of makes a difference to understand. And yet, even within our institute, we had undescribed species of bats because we're very good at lumping a whole load of species together because they kind of look similar. Another issue is, of course, in a region like Southeast Asia, it's particularly difficult to do any form of taxonomic research because every country speaks a different language. And so a researcher can find something in one country and then a researcher in another country goes out and collecting and they're like, oh, that, that, this description sounds similar. I think it's the same species. And until recently, people would often not put those two specimens side by side and say, hang on a minute, this isn't the same thing. And so we're now realizing what we thought was wide ranging species is often a number of species in a complex. Sometimes what we called one species when we start looking at the genetics is up to 12 species and they all have much smaller ranges. And so overlap, just, to just, just out of curiosity. So if we already have so much problems, you know, differentiating all the different bat species, what does this mean for the, you know, for the pathogens they might hold, like viral genomes, right? Because people seem to have this appearance, ah, you know, people went out to send for 10,000 bats. Now we know what viruses are out there. But what you say is like, you know, actually we haven't even got the, the hosts <laughs> collected. What does this mean for whatever? identify a vertebrate species how are we meant to identify the viruses it's carrying? Like our coverage of these species is minute. Um, yeah. Most of the region has not been sampled for, and we do not have good range maps for most of these species. So no, we are touching the tip of the iceberg and saying any more than that would not be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, 
But what we do know is that not only is there huge bat diversity across Asia, but they're all carrying lots of uh, fun viruses too. Um, now, <laughs> I've, I've handled thousands of bats. I've been bitten by a reasonable number of bats because that's what can happen sometimes. Um, I, when I am handling them, do not feel like I am particularly at risk. The majority of bats in Asia, for example, have very small teeth. So they're unlikely to break the skin, even if you were handling them and did get bitten. The risk is going to be much higher that any virus is either going to go through an intermediate host or if someone eats them, it's like having a nice big dose of a potential uh, mm. pathogen vector. Uh, it's never a good idea to eat something with a better immune system than you. <laughs> that I think is a good thing to remember. <laughs> is, that, is that a common thing? Because at, at the start of the pandemic obviously there was a there was a lot of um concern about stigma and you know not being not being sensitive to various cultural practices is is that idea of eating bats actually a, a, a real reality and a real problem regarding regarding viruses? i'd say in my work in asia across the whole of tropical asia and that includes south china probably at least half of the caves we visit have evidence of recent hunting and that's for food wow. um for larger species, they'll also be hunting in the forest. It's also um, a sport or a community thing. But many indigenous communities, as well as just local people across much of Asia, are consuming bats. Um, now, of course, you do have any various forms of racial stigma. It's important to remember that in places like the Asia Pacific region, bats were actually often the largest mammals on some islands. And some of them were hunted to such high degrees that they actually went regionally extinct. Um, the common name that people call one of the large flying fox species in Thailand is Kankau Megai. stands for flying chicken bat. It's called the flying chicken bat because everyone says it's delicious. And as a consequence, most colonies are now only around temples because every other colony got eaten to regional extinction. Wow. So, so there was a recent preprint from Peter Daschek and Ecos Alliance and also I think Xi Sheng Li was on it. And they said, you know, uh, zoonotic spill over risk for SARS viruses is like, you know, there's like 60,000 a year, something like that. Uh, it, does that square with your experiences? Would you say this is a realistic number? Because many people say, oh, that seems so high. Um, what, what, what is your feeling? So I think something that hasn't been thought about much is acquired immunity across the Asian region. Now, there, I know I've read of some evidence to suggest that bat researchers in, I think it was Taiwan, um, were resistant to SARS-CoV-2 because they've been exposed before. Mm. Uh, I didn't get tested because I thought that if I was resistant before being immunized in China, maybe not the best idea because um, they think I had had COVID rather than just played with thousands of bats. Yeah. Um, I think something we need to remember now is if we look at, the first wave of COVID didn't really hit Asia, didn't really hit Asia at all. It was later variants that were sufficiently mutated that started hitting Asia. And I think a reason for that is that the initial variants are very close to viruses that are naturally circulating across Asia. And a lot of people therefore have immunity, whether or not they eat wildlife. And a lot of people still do eat wildlife. And so I think there was enough resistance within those populations that the initial versions of COVID basically didn't encounter enough naive hosts to spread. And so that's when we saw big waves later on, because then it was different enough. Now, yeah. a phenomenon that we need to remind ourselves of now is the fact that people move a lot more. So when we have seen spillovers in the past, okay, maybe they hit a couple of people, yeah. maybe not that badly, um, because they have some degree of immunity. But now you have someone coming from an urban area and, oh, I'll, I'll try this new thing. Yeah, I'd love to have that hot pot. And I have had foreign friends mm -hmm. who have been just given a hot pot and they're like, hang on in a minute this is a bat. Mm. And even in, I think it was 2014, a colleague of mine sent me a picture of a bat's head between mm. their chopsticks. And I sent them back a list of zoonotic diseases mm. from fruit bats. Um, if naive hosts encounter viruses and they then go back and they meet other naive hosts, then we get outbreaks. And so cities where you have people who are going out trying these new things mm. could be a potentially under explored risk mm. of these future spillover events and, and i guess that plays both ways yeah. right you people taking the animals from those areas into 
into mm-hmm. urban areas is, is yeah. basically the the same thing, but but in reverse, right? So this is a this is exactly a thing. you are exposing naive hosts, mm-hmm. and this is where we see something that has changed a huge amount. And so whilst those spillovers in the background always happened, mm. they weren't serious because they people already had a degree yes. of immunity. Now we have naive hosts and we have large aggregations of them. And that's mm. where you see a huge risk. Yeah, I mean, we, we have modeling studies that show that, you know, if a virus like SARS-CoV-2 would hit, you know, like a village, you know, it would die out like 99 99- uh, um, 0.9% of the times because it would never, you know, be able to establish enough uh, onward transmission. But if you, you know, bring it to the Huanan market in Wuhan and you have a, a lot of people to go there again and again, and, you know, eventually they will start spreading forward. Well, so. also, if in that village, 50, 60, 70% of people are immune, then yeah. you get very short chains. Yeah. In that urban environment, mm-hmm. you're probably going to see a much smaller percentage yeah. as well as yeah. uh, larger. But, but how is the how is the so I, I know from some studies people looked at, for example, some some studies uh, looking at the antibody uh, uh, levels for you know um, coronaviruses, and you know they didn't. I mean, there is some in specific groups like you know uh, cave hunters, iguano farmers. There's like up to twenty percent of people that have immunity, but never at this level of like fifty percent that that you're advancing here. So do do we have any good data? Do we just not look deep enough into the right people? Because you know, usually these people are marginalized or not even on the map or on the grid and stuff like that. There's what is a your lot explanation? of indigenous groups across Asia. When I have talked to Han colleagues about eating bats, most of them say, oh, that's horrible. Mm. But most indigenous groups are still eating them. Mm. Um, in fact, I would see, say a large proportion of the indigenous groups in South China and the rest of Southeast Asia are consuming bats. And I think that there may be a degree of mistrust when it comes to being sampled. And so those indigenous groups are likely to be disproportionately underrepresented in sampling. Okay, so there's a lot of social factors that also might, you know, screw our picture of what is really going on. And, you know, we, we, are, we are flying blind still, although we know there's a risk, we are still fl- flying blind in many many aspects of this is that is that um, a bat pun or is that just if it is it's a bad one no bats it was, it was a bad one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i thought i thought he was trying to sneak one so i i just you know because you're we, we 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 don't have a lot of you know um people that really go out into the field so maybe can you describe just how how does your work look like how do you catch you know bats and and you said you know sometimes they scratch you they might bite you uh, also we know that SARS virus is usually in bats are more in the intestinal system not so much you know coughed out so can you just explain a little I mean, bit about i'm interested in this because you see bear grills running you, it's around it's not going to do a whole lot um <laughs> so we have a number of different methods of sensing bats and I've been working on bats. Well, my PhD started a long time ago now. So I started focusing a lot on bats in about 2008. But I was working on bats at least a bit in tropical environments since about 2005. So I've done a lot of bat work in a lot of places. Um, Typically, when we're doing site visits, this will include a number of different things. So sometimes we'll just be doing a bioacoustic visit when we're going to a cave with our bat detector. And yes, it is called that. The (laughs) earlier versions look like something from Ghostbusters and try explaining that going through airport security. Um, Does it come on a utility belt or is it, you know? I mean, you could probably attach it, but the first ones were like this big and had a giant microphone on top. And when you're going through security and they're like, what's that? You say, oh, it's a bat detector. <laughs> you get some pretty odd looks. <laughs> anyway. So, so, so does that work by detecting the amplitude of sound to try yeah. and get an idea of so how many there are? Or? Each species of bat has a unique call. Oh. Um, most bats echolocate, and we sometimes call that a bioacoustic signature. It's a bit like a fingerprint but based on their call and so by literally walking around with the bat detector and then analyzing the call you can often work out what species is there and then you can get the activity levels by how many are calling you can count to some degree sometimes you can work out the number of individuals you can always work out the activity it's basically the 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 shazam app but for bats right (laughs) yeah yeah bat shazam okay um so we'll go to the caves and those caves you might have to hike up a mountain to get to them. You might have to swim into them with um, a waterproof bag with your bat detector, et cetera, in, and maybe a hand net if you're doing small amounts of sampling. I don't like hand nets because you can injure the bats. And 
I don't want to injure animals when I can help it. And then we might do our cave survey. Sometimes we will literally go underground for several kilometers doing a bioacoustic survey to see what's in the cave, or you might go through a mountain from one side to the other or to a river or something. And so you, you have to be pretty fit to do this kind of thing <laughs> because it, it, sometimes you have to squeeze through small gaps, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the main methods we use when we're doing something like looking at viruses, okay, you can put down tarpaulins, but you want to know what species are there. And so whilst you can use DNA from the feces to work out what species are there, that doesn't really give you the per individual uh, concentrations and spread. So a lot of our work is based on capturing bats. Now to capture bats, we use generally two major types of trap. We use the mist net, which is a big thin net that you put up on poles. Those poles may up be up to about six meters high mm -hmm. and those are good for sampling in open areas but the trouble is for a lot of bats because they can detect these they'll just go around them plus nobody likes mist nets you have to untangle the bats manually yeah. their every finger in their wings can bend in a different way yeah. so they're at risk of injury yeah. if they have a baby the baby may be separated from them which again oh, yeah. we want to avoid That's and so we use them when we have to but we don't like them our main method for catching bats is something called a harp trap. Now, a harp trap is two to four sets of parallel fishing lines. And basically, you've got a line like this and then another line, which is slightly at a different angle. So the bats will orientate themselves so they can go through the first line. Mm -hmm. And then on the second line, they will hit one of the fishing lines. Uh, yeah. And so they get deflected. Like sort of down cross polarizers back. kind of thing. Idea. And yeah. so they get deflected into a big bag at the bottom, mm. and then we will get them out of the bag, put them in cotton bags, and then we mm. measure each individual, take whatever samples we need, and then release them at the end of the night and record the echolocation. So when we're next doing a bioacoustic, we know the species, because mm. just like humans, they can have local dialects, and that actually accelerates <laughs> the rate of speciation, because if their calls get too different, then they might not recognize each other as the same species anymore especially as so in our eyes we have something called the phobia in the middle which is basically super high accuracy vision yes bats have something called an acoustic phobia so the part of their cochlea that is related to their call is expanded so they have oh. super high resolution but that also means if the call shifts too much mm. then they basically can't really hear it because it falls outside their acoustic phobia and that means that you can have quite a high rate of speciation potentially because it might form a pre-mating barrier because suddenly they don't realize it's the same species and so when we're doing this work we also get individual calls of bats so that we can say okay well we've got the dna because we've got a tissue sample we have the call and we can link those back together um and for the harp traps they're about a meter and a half two meters wide and we'll use them to block a cave entrance or block what we call a flyway Bats mm -hmm. are lazy. So when they wake up, they're kind of cranky. They want to eat. They all go the most efficient way they can yeah, to yeah. find food. <laughs> and so they'll use things like paths or roads or rivers. And then we put a trap in there and we catch the grumpy bats. <laughs> so there's a bias towards Strong grumpy bias bats. Towards <laughs> grumpy bats yeah. Some of them are very cranky, uh, especially certain groups like the hippocidarids. Um Hippocidarids have a lot of testosterone and are pretty aggressive. So uh, we all have our favorite bats to work with, but I don't know many people who like angry hippocidarids. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. One more thing about bats is, I mean, you already said they have this amazing metabolism. They have this specialized hearing, but you also in a different conversation, I saw you said they had a very special immune system. And maybe you can talk about that a little bit because I I, I, I don't know the biology behind it's that. It's bizarre for, for, for just for me as a completely naive non-expert to to have this animal that seems to have so many to be a reservoir for so many viruses and yet is quite happily flying around not being bothered by by any of them so so maybe if you could yeah sort of it's some pretty incredible i mean when you work on bats you start thinking of humans as a little bit pathetic like <laughs> If our temperature goes up or down more than a few degrees, we die. Like our cells are pretty weak. Um, when you generate as much heat as a bat does, it basically means that you have to make every, optimize everything in their body. And so as we get older, we start down-regulating certain genes and up-regulating others in terms of activating them. Bats do the opposite. 
So as we get old and our skin starts to get saggy because we don't have enough collagen, they actually will enhance collagen because if you get brittle bones and you're not flexible, you can't exactly fly very well. And so an old bat, if it was physically old, would die. Um, and so even when we look at the telomeres of certain bat species, we know that with humans, typically telomeres get shorter as we age. We can use it as another index to see how old an, a human is. But in some bats, the telomeres don't even get shorter. Um, so even on a cellular level, everything has basically been optimized so that they generally don't age. Um, even on a cellular level, if an infection is introduced, they may show no reaction. When we get an infection, we normally show an inflammatory response, but bats don't have an inflammatory response. Um, and so with many bacteria and viral infections, bats are like, oh, something's entered our cell. Oh, well. And it's part of this evolutionary arms race, but it means that even when the cell by cell mechanisms have been looked at, sometimes they basically ignore the virus and it can replicate to some degree, but not at a degree that it actually makes the animal physically ill. Mm. And so they can hold it, they can shed it, but they generally won't get sick. But this also throws up some really important questions that we're only just starting to tackle. And those are, we know, for example, in humans, when we're stressed out, we downregulate our immune system and we get sick. We don't really know how bats respond. We do know that pregnant and lactating bats that are carrying viruses will shed more virus during that time period. So there's at least some relationship there. But for things like hibernation or migration, we still don't have a good enough understanding of how that impacts their propensity to spread viruses. And that's really important because as we develop habitats, as we destroy caves, as we do at an enormous rate, we're destroying about 5.7% of um, Southeast Asian castes every year. Um, we're stressing animals out. We're causing new interactions. We might be, for example, because most many bat species will have what's called a maternity roost. So female bats, when they go and give birth, often don't want to share their space with the male bats. So they go and they breed in a separate cave. But if you've destroyed enough caves, you're going to start getting these aggregations of bats that are denser than they should be, that have species that would not normally interact, especially at those key periods. And so you create these novel environments that are potentially dangerous from a spillover perspective. And this is something we still have a poor handle on and we need to do much better on because we are continuing to cause these novel aggregations, mm. et cetera. And there is a huge risk of future spillover as a consequence of this. So it's not only about us coming geographically closer to bats by, you know, building a town right next to their cars, but it's also changing the environment in which bats operate and interact with one another, which can potentially lead to, to different and potentially dangerous yeah. situations. I mean, if all of the bats are losing their roosts, they need to find new roosts. That's stressful. If you are destroying and degrading their habitats, so they need to range over a much wider area, that takes energy. So their health is going to suffer. Mm -hmm. If it means they have to range over farmland, they're going to be exposed to agrochemicals, another form of stress. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're ranging over farmland, they may also interact with domestic animals or mm -hmm. livestock. These are all risk factors. So thinking both about the, is stress going to cause them to shed more is important, mm. but also is stress and loss of habitat going to create new interfaces between those bats and other animals where they could either encounter or spread zoonoses. And this is something, I mean, this is what the One Health concept yeah. should be. Yeah. And it's still something we have a very poor understanding of in bats. And because bats like being difficult, Things like cortisol aren't even good stress hormones for them. So with most mammals, we're like, oh, cortisol, indicator of stress. Apparently bats, not so much, because, of course, they just want to make it challenging for us bat yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, wow, I, mean yeah. they're, they're, I mean, even from this, this, this short discussion, I'm like, wow, bats are uh, really amazing. You know, Batman makes a lot more sense now. You know, it's, uh, mm. Oh, real really, bats yeah. are way cooler than yeah, Batman. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when people think about bats, they don't realize that, I mean, bats are the smallest mammal on earth. Uh, about 1.5 grams could fit on your thumb tip, the smallest one, Crassionictus thonglongi. Uh, the largest ones have a wingspan of almost six feet. So probably you guys' <laughs> height. Slight size difference there. 
Um, yeah. yeah, that's from Incredible Animals. Wow. That is, that is, yeah, I'm so happy that we had this conversation finally, because I've seen your name pop up on, you know, a lot of papers over the years about, you know, finding, you know, and uh, not ancestors, but close, you know, family members of South Coast too, you know, talking about, you know, uh, zoonotic spillover risk. So in my, in, in, in my research in this topic, I see you're always, you're somewhere in there. And now I understand a little bit better why that is because. <laughs> the, the cell paper from last year, I remember we, we discussed, didn't we, Philip? I, I, yeah. think, I can't remember what it was. It was sort of towards the end of last science year, paper, no? it? Uh, science paper, maybe. Yeah. Towards the end of last year, I remember. Yeah, uh, where you. So th this was one of the key elements when 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 we started working into, and this is uh, going to be our next topic. It's going to be about um, the origins of SARS-CoV-2 and the, the discussions about this. But how how we came into it, what for me was one of these uh, moments was when you know there came your science paper out uh, where you say you know ah oh, we went sampling you know we we found you know you know within you know thirty beds we found four that are you know that had SARS um uh cov2 related family members and i was like what you just go and you find them right there so clearly you know it's not you know we we have no idea about the I biodiversity can't remember what the wording of it was it was like a very small area it was i think it was called a garden of some description it was your, your... yeah yeah it was in my institute um, <laughs> right okay. which is a tourist <laughs> yeah uh, a it's tourist, not even uh, some like dang area cave like hidden in the background it's just you know in the middle in the middle of an institute Yes, basically, there was, I mean, most of our sampling was in the forest in the Institute and most of those bats were roosting in just one cave and they were still had a whole load of different SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 like viruses. So, so yeah, yeah, this is, this is, uh, and this brings us then to kind of a bit more of the meaty part of, of the discussion. So now there were two science papers. Not, not wild meat, I hope. <laughs> Hopefully not. There were two science papers uh, recently published uh, about, you know, really narrowing down saying, okay, um, human to human transmission chains started at the UNN market, most likely from what we can tell. Definitely the pandemic started there. It was the epicenter of the pandemic and the cases spread out from there. And then also we have some phylogenetic um, evidence that shows, you know, there was probably like more than one introduction, at least two, because we had two early lineages that, you know, started the separate transmission chains that then caused the, uh, the pandemic. And so they also said, you know, um, basically everything points to wildlife being, you know, at the market and that causing, you know, the spillover, you know, but there's some upstream uncertainty, you know, we don't know, maybe there is some animal handlers that brought the virus to the market. This is of course a narrative that is more preferred from the Chinese authorities because then it could have come from further away, you know, and, and we just wanted to get a bit of your ideas about, you know, how could this have happened? Um, what could be, you know, uh, sensible ways to look uh at this problem you know with further studies and stuff like that because people and very much talk to you know the, the the origins were probably in southeast asia looking at the the viral diversity that we know about and then they say oh there's a there's a bit of a huge dis difference uh, a di and a distance between that area and you know wuhan so where it emerged yeah yeah, yeah. so let's talk rhinolophids which i'm sure people regularly do um, all the time <laughs> oh absolutely so rhinolophids have been basically chased down to being the source of sars uh mers and sars cov2 so we know that these guys are very good at carrying coronaviruses Within parts of South China and Southeast Asia, we have aggregations of up to about 14 species of rhinolophid that will be utilizing the same environment. Um, those animals will be sharing their roost sites with other species of bats, some of which, which may be migrating up to tens or even hundreds of kilometers. We're still trying to collect data on that. It's difficult because bats are too small to really um, do migratory analysis of so we're using isotopes to try and work that out so there's, so there's no this... that you can't tag them put a little chip on them and, and kind of see where they go oh, it's not you a... could if you could genuinely easily recapture them yeah. but in the mark recapture studies in asia where i know of people who tagged i think a thousand bats with a ring they didn't recapture one of them <laughs> um and so when you have such a low recapture rate it's difficult yeah. so we're trying to use isotopes which should at least give us some idea of where these species are going but it means that you've got a lot of different interacting factors that could be at play in terms of exposure. Um, however, what we also know is bats will often share caves with other animals. And as well as eating wildlife, wildlife is used for a variety of other purposes. And 
I was asked first in January 2020 by various journalists, where do, where do you think it came from? And I said, well, civets or raccoon dogs are a good key. Uh, we know that they are very good at flushing viruses and things through their systems. Uh, the way that they urinate, et cetera, means that it, it can spread easily. Um, and these are animals that are often kept in very poor conditions within cages, which might be stacked on each other. And the problem is in much of the Asian region is there are fur farms for these animals. And the numbers within those fur farms may be buffered by capturing animals locally or regionally and mixing them with those captive populations. So you have an open system which you are bringing animals which may be potentially sick um, into these systems and where they are very well adapted to spread any viruses they have. Under current laws, even with the updated wildlife laws, having fur farms is not prohibited. And some of the animals that are most likely to be spreading these kinds of zoonoses are often in fur farms. And so this is an issue that needs to be looked at Asia wide because we should not be, we should not have fur farms of basically any of the carnivores. It is a significant risk. Mm. Some of those animals we know also will be sharing caves with the bats. We found things like porcupine quills in the middle of caves. And so there are various possible chains of transmission. The northernmost uh, rhinolophid species will be occurring through most of China, even though the diversity is lower. But you don't need to have a huge number of species for, and being that you have the sequential layering of different species ranges and overlap, even if you only had a small number, spillover could still have occurred in those areas. Um, it's also going to be a period of the year when, I mean, the initial spillover is thought to be like November last year. Um, this is a period when breeding is happening. Of course, we don't know how long it was on each reservoir first, mm. but if we think about stressful events and stressful yeah. times, those may be times when spillover risk is going to be highest. And so thinking about those interactions and also the fact that some of these species will co-utilize human spaces. So maybe your civets are in a barn, bats will roost in a barn. So you've got these possible transmission chains and we do not know what the intermediate host is yet it it is possible it came straight from a bat it is more likely as has happened with many other viruses that there was an intermediate host um and a great case study of just how important intermediate hosts are i wouldn't think of mers as the first case i would think of hendra so within australia people would relatively commonly rescue bats because if there is a tropical storm or a cyclone, sometimes the mother bat will be killed. The orphan baby bats, which are adorable, um, get adopted by people. Mm. And there was never any spillover of Hendra. But then there are often mango trees in horse paddocks or boosting trees. And so what basically happened is from what is known, bats would use these mango trees, they would suck the mangoes, they would produce various fluids as well as chewed up seeds. And the horses would graze underneath. The horses got Hendra from the bats, the horses gave Hendra to humans. And so we know that these types of train, chains of transmission are important. And it may be that thinking more about those interactions, which again is something we're not very good at doing, is going to be critical because you're not just thinking of the direct interface, you are thinking about this link. Oh, good. Who's that, peeping? That That's my phone, which no, I right. will now. <laughs> so there's one interesting thing, just uh, to give a little bit of context. So in China, bef right before the pandemic, there was also, you know, an outbreak of African swine flu in the pork population and that they eradicated like, you know, half of all domestic pork production. Like five types of swine flu yeah. circulating in China at the moment. And it has been found in people working in the swine farms as well. So, yeah. Yes. And and so then what happened is, you know, if you have such a huge economic fallout from, from these viruses circulating in animals, then maybe, you know, the pork prices increase and, and people look for alternative sources of, you know, meat. And this is then where, for example, you know, fur farm animals might also end up on the market being sold for meat. And, they always you know, were anyway, but they may become more mainstream. Yeah, more economically attractive, right? 
right? So there's an economic layer to ecosystemic disruption. And if in November there is really this, you know, breeding seasons from the bats, and then you have this enormous wildlife movements from people, you know, trying to compensate for the increased pork prices by getting bush meat that is, you know, as a, uh, as a compensatory mechanism, it, it seems kind of, you know, a, a lot of factors play together. Well, you to know where increase. the real risk is, it's mm -hmm. restaurants and places. So I have had colleagues tell me on occasions years ago that there were children giggling at the end of their table. And eventually they were like, why are you laughing? Why mm -hmm. are you laughing? And the children eventually said, you're eating mice. And basically the mice had been minced. And so what was meant to be a beef dish was actually minced mouse. Um, restaurants can very easily disguise meat. So yeah. even though most people wouldn't choose to eat these animals, even mm. Han Chinese, et cetera, the, if meat becomes expensive, it may be the restaurants, it, it's not recognizable anyway, we'll just mince whatever meat is cheap. And so, again, this is where you see a risk. And then you don't need to have people who want to eat that animal because the people selling it don't say it's yeah. that animal. And, I mean, we have those kinds of scandals in the West as well. Yeah. Um, I remember, I remember how upset. Scandal. Yeah, I remember how upset the Brits got at eating the horse meat, even though the French wouldn't bat an eye at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is, is the there, so, so, so maybe if, if a question that, that jumps to mind, you talk about these these rural areas in Southeast Asia where, where you know, eating these animals is, is very common. You know, the interaction between various farmed animals and bats is very common. Is there is there a clear pathway from um, these areas up to places like like Wuhan in, in terms of, you know, delivering those animals or, or, or a desire for those animals to be brought from these areas to or smuggling these, yeah, these kind of things? Uh, I mean, in, again, it's a multi-layered answer. We know those animals were in the Hunan market. That is indisputable. Um, we even know where things like raccoon dogs were in that market. So, yes, those animals were there. Where they came from, even the people selling them probably couldn't have told you because they may have had a mixture of captive bred animals and wild caught animals. Certainly before the pandemic, many of those borders were very poor. And, I mean, I had students who would take buses from Laos and would tell me about the cages of wildlife that were on the bus until the border and then mysteriously not there anymore. Um, yeah, so we know we know things were coming over the border before the pandemic and not irregularly either. And understanding where those things came from is pretty much impossible. But there are also a lot of people who want to have wild meat. This is, again, something that a lot of people don't realize now in much of africa wild meat is genuinely for subsistence like going and eating diker is probably because it's the cheapest meat in asia it's generally not the case in asia meat wild meat is often much more expensive than domestic meat and it seemed to be by at least some populations as more delicious and stronger um so it's more of a cultural practice and a, and a kind of the way it's always been done rather than rather than potentially an economic driver i think i remember a study of an old colleague of mine did where they found that squirrel meat was something like five times weight for weight that of beef uh in terms of the price so yeah people will pay more for it now an interesting factor that isn't considered there is there may actually be some truth in the fact that people say it's tastier because given that you don't have good standards around things like steroids hormones etc in domesticated meat you probably don't have the best meat yeah. and so if it's been cooked in a simple way maybe something that is not pumped full of steroids yeah. and hormones is genuinely going to taste better yeah. but rather than saying well let's go for wild uh mouse deer or deer yeah. then let's increase the safety standards so actually yeah. when meat is produced it is of higher quality yeah that's it this is this is of course. I mean, you you are very ecosystemic thinker, and and again and again, you you bring so many different lines of of things to think about. And and, and this is also how how I think we should think about these things because it's not just one thing. And this is also when we got people talk at the want very, easy answers, don't they? they yeah, want, they want it to be just one. When thing. we talk at the very end a bit about pandemic prevention, this is something that will come up again. It's not one thing that we need to do. There is, you know. And there's not one killer thing. It's not like, okay, we shut down all the virologists, we'll never have a pandemic again. This is not how it works. Or, or we well, shut down all the markets. And yeah, we shut down all the well. markets. It, what, what we really need is to improve, 
you know, practices throughout the board, economic, you know, factors for many people throughout the world, plus on top, you know, reduce risk as much as we can in all these different layers. And I think we're going to talk about that at the very end. But now well, I, I that, want to... Just before you move on, that's another interesting point to bring up. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me, people don't eat this stuff anymore, do they? And yeah. local communities have not changed what they're eating. Because if you have grown up eating wild meat and your parents ate it and your grandparents ate it, the government telling you that suddenly this thing you've done all your life is dangerous. When, when you say nowadays, do you mean nowadays like in this decade or do you mean after the outbreak of the pandemic? Literally still doing I have outbreak. had my students send me photos of traps put outside caves. I have had colleagues in places like Laos showing me the photos through the pandemic of the local market. The, the pandemic has not changed what rural people are eating yeah. across most of rural Asia because their experience trumps what the government tells them. And we also need to remember that for many of them, they didn't really see much of the pandemic because not only did some of them have resistance, but also it didn't reach all of these communities. Mm -hmm. And so this theoretical thing that the government is telling them is just yet another thing that the government is telling them versus their own experience. And they're still eating wild meat today. And I think that that is the case for most of Asia. I've had evidence of it in, I think, at least four countries in the last year. So interesting yeah that's a that's a sobering realization right because there's people think that you know if we if we blame china or the chinese government you know because they failed to, to shut down the markets completely but this is this is a much bigger thing right and so blame is not the right framework to address pandemic risk right it's not like you know there's this conversation if it's natural and came from the market we have to blame the chinese for not shutting down the market if it came out of the lab you know it's it's we have to blame the virologists doing this dangerous research but none of this is really productive none of this is really true oh it's counterproductive it's just created a level of distrust between communities across the world mm. and many of the videos that were circulating of the Wuhan market were actually an Indonesian market and if you looked at the posters on the wall they had Indonesian words on it because yeah meat consumption from wild meat is much bigger there um so yeah uh, and that probably talks to, to the sort of that probably talks to the sort of the ignorance of western people talking about these things as well right it's like oh chuck up a picture of a market where it looks like they sell dodgy animals and that's good enough for the article because <laughs> that that's cool. kind of the idea that a lot of western people have isn't it right that, that they have this kind of bigoted idea that these people are sort of backwards and stupid and they're eating things that are going to kill them and they don't actually understand that on the ground this might not be a problem for these communities maybe they've been doing this for a long time maybe they have immunity to these things so when people well, come people wading also, in without knowing all of these factors, it, it like you said, it's, it's completely counterproductive. People are very willing to point the finger. I had so many people sending me videos being like, look at the Chinese eating this. And I was like, that species doesn't live in China. And especially if it's a large fruit bat, there isn't going to be anyone who wants it enough to have imported that species. And so, yeah, people are very willing to lay blame. But the reality is that, this is an issue that exists across much of the planet. And um, unless we think more systemically about how we minimize risk in all markets, we're going to continue to see issues. And just formally, I have to ask, you know, is there any amount of evidence that would make you convince you that it actually came out, you know, of a US bio lab or out of, you know, the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Or is this something that is for you who, you know, interact so much with pets, who know so much about these issues? Is this something that seems absurd? Well, I mean, I haven't seen any evidence that convinces me and that... And open to evidence. I think we all need to be open to what evidence is there. But if we know that it's circulating in bats across Asia, then why do we need to bring in all of these conspiracy theories behind it? And I There's do a lot think of Rube Goldberg machine going on, isn't there, with, with a lot of these ideas? It feels like. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And the reality is that we are continuing to destroy habitats across the planet at an unparalleled rate. We have issues like climate change to contend with, which are going to change how systems operate and again, bring up new risk factors. Unless we think very carefully about how we manage habitat, it's not if the next epidemic or pandemic happens, it is when. 
And yes. continuing to point fingers and lay blame is not going to provide solutions to that. Thinking about how we can develop equitable strategies to enable us to minimize those risks is critical. And it's still not a conversation we are willing to have. Mm. There are still too many people yep. who just want to use it to lay blame rather than generate meaningful solutions. Yeah, we're very much on this train. Look, show us the evidence, show us where it goes. But but, but linking... That doesn't sell books, though. No, of course it doesn't. <laughs> and, and, and linking... I, 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 I mean, I've said this with a, with, a, with a few people. Look, regardless regardless of what the origins turn out to be, it doesn't mean that we, we can't ask this question of how can we prevent these things going forward, whether that be beefing up security on the lab side or dealing with these zoonotic spillovers. Regardless of this one specific origin, doesn't mean we can't have these important conversations. Yeah. I, I... I mean, SARS... Cov one, I think, spilled out of the lab locally two or three times. Um, these things can happen, but that was already a virus that had been isolated from humans. And I think across all of these factors, we need good biosafety, be it in labs, be it in any type of farm situation. And many industrial scale farms in the West now have very good biosecurity because they know that there are risks. Um, we need to look across all systems rather than just focusing in on one. But things like the consumption of wildlife does remain a considerable risk across much of the planet. And I mean, another useful case in point, Ebola. Now, people love blaming bats for Ebola, but actually Ebola has never been, the most severe Zaire Ebola has never been found in a bat. We just, we like blaming them. There's a terrible paper with very circuitous information that tried blaming them because it's easy. Actually, the best reservoirs for Ebola are still blue dica. Blue dica are commonly consumed. So mm -hmm. let's think about what those risks look like and try to target them while still making sure that people can access livelihoods or sources of protein. Yeah, I mean, we, we had, this is a common theme. We had a conversation uh, with um, Wendy Orent, and she is a, an expert on the plague pandemic, Yersinia pestis. And she said, you know, there are still people eating, you know, these marmots that have this dangerous plague. And there has been plague outbreaks locally all the time. And if you don't have the scientists going around, you know, uh, making sure it doesn't happen, we would have a lot more plague in the world. So, yeah. And, and for other, you know, for other areas, we don't have that. We don't have, you know, I don't know, a, an arsenal of people, each country that looks like, well, what is for my country, the specific risk area? And we have some people doing the surveillance of the animal populations there, or, you know, being at these places. I mean, the, the Huanan market from the Chinese CDC, they know it was a risk. They took Edward Holmes and said, you know, this is one of those places where it can happen. And uh, see there, you know, seven years later or six years later, it came from there. So it's like, all right. So it's, if there is more manpower, if there's more understanding, you know, we, we can we can prevent a lot of things without, you know, having to invest crazy amounts, you know, paying scientists to do this kind of work. You need, you know, a dedicated team per country. It's it's not something it's way cheaper than, you know, stem, stomaching the next pandemic coming, especially globally, because, you know, if you finance, you know, this effort, you have to finance then in the tropics, in Indonesia, in, you know, around the world. This is peanuts compared to what the pandemic costs the world and what had what it has cost the world so i think that that leads us on philip does it not into discussing how, how easy is it to kind of do this work at the moment in in china alice because what yeah. you know what kind of studies would be useful to do to elucidate more about you know bat ranges and and where mm -hmm. these these viruses are circulating in nature maybe give us some idea about where sars-cov-2 origins were what sort of studies would be good to do and and how easy how is it how easy when I can speak is it to do those in the in the current environment in China? So I think like many things, we need to have short and long-term strategies. So in terms of minimizing future outbreaks, I think there are certain groups of animals we just need to stop eating. Um, and if farmed at all, it needs to be done with extreme care. That includes most carnivores because higher trophic levels basically concentrate up anything that their hosts have been eating. And so you would be far more likely to contract some infectious disease from eating a cat or a lion than you would be their prey because that's just how it works. Uh, bats, the same thing. They have much better immune systems than us. So eating them is not a good idea. Um, and so I think those things go on the table automatically. And those are things that can be laid out quite widely as, okay, in terms of risk, 
unless you have good evidence to the contrary, you just don't eat these things. And if you're farming them, then you need to have regular tests to make sure that they are not hosting diseases. You need to have transparent systems where you're not importing in an animal that's come from the wild, trucked over from Laos in stressful conditions with a cage mate that died somewhere on the way. I mean, that's what we see now. We know that there is extreme risk. I also think we need to move away from the eyes idea of chasing down bat zero bat zero probably died uh, a while ago uh, not of SARS-CoV-2 but of being eaten by a snake or yeah. a person or something um, we need to be thinking about generalities because it's understanding these generalities that will help us prevent further pandemic events that means we need to understand where spillover risk exists and how we can minimize it and that means looking at the interface between bats and other systems so are there times of year we should not be mining casts? Yeah. Are there ways that we can mine casts? Because we still need cement where we minimize the stress to animals. The same with guano mining. Yeah. So how can we minimize those types of risk in those environments? How can we reconnect habitats so the bat does not need to fly over the pig farm in order to access enough um, foraging space? Thinking about connectivity, thinking about how these animals use landscapes. So we minimize the opportunities for spillover between those animals and livestock and humans. Um, in addition to that, we need to be thinking about how we can safeguard them. So we minimize the amount of stress they are experiencing. To do the research to help us do that, we need to be looking at these cave systems and looking at, for example, for your hibernating bats, how is the shedding changing? Um, when we have seen a novel aggregation because they did lose their roost, are you seeing an increase in uh, viral shedding? So looking at these kinds of interactions is going to be critical if we're going to manage these landscapes. And then when it comes to the consumption of wildlife, ultimately in many parts of the world, it, it's not needed anymore. Um, cultures that are doing it as a status symbol will have a different status symbol instead, like organic meat or something where you can say, okay, well, I'm choosing to eat a diet that is better for me and is lower risk. Mm -hmm. um, doing the work in many areas has become more challenging because the way um, SARS-CoV-2 has been reported has not only created distrust, I mean, I think every bat researcher has been called every name under the sun from being called a Russian spy to a CPC puff piece. And yeah, I've, I've been called both of those hmm. because doing this kind of work in China is difficult from both uh, the Western perspective when they're trying to tell their narrative yeah. and then there is now a cautionary reaction from China because yeah. if you don't think you're going to be believed then you become okay well let's not provide any evidence because yeah. it's not going to be believed anyway yeah. and so now we have one side that says well we you're not going to believe us and you're going to blame us anyway. So let's just stop providing any evidence that allows an evaluation. And on the other side, they're saying, well, you're not providing anything. So you must be hiding something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really that dialogue has massively hindered our ability to do work. And as a foreign scientist doing this stuff in China, it, it hasn't been easy, <laughs> as you can guess. I mean, it's not as if I blend in. Um, yeah. <laughs> But we need to do better. And yeah. if we're not going to see future pandemics, we will see epidemics, at least on a regional scale, then we need to do a huge amount better. And that means get distilling from this the core disciplines that allow us to manage these landscapes better to prevent future spillover events. And at the moment, we haven't done that. We have in no way succeeded in minimizing the risk. Um, and so maybe the next proper spillover is going to happen next year yeah. or five years or 10 years. Yeah. But unless we start learning something core from this, it is going to happen again. Yeah. I think this is, this is the thing that also my, my longer article on this topic finished exactly like that. We get distracted by playing these blame games and we are not addressing the core of the issue and we are losing time. We're sitting on these, you know, biological time bombs and they are ticking and we are like, you know, doing you know running around with clowns instead of instead of getting people trained educating people right i mean this is this is one of the things right how do you change behavior you need some people that educate you need some people that do surveillance you need some global initiatives as well we talked to uh carlos morel and he you know he's he's working in the amazon and he said you know there's you need local, you need regional, local and global initiatives in order to to manage these problems and at the moment we, we don't do any properly because 
you know, pe people don't want to generate data because locally, because they are afraid of being blamed if they, you know, if they find something, they don't want to share globally because of geopolitics between, you know, economic uh, adversity between China, but also, of course, then for the pandemic, people want to blame somebody psychologically, it's easier to say, ah, you know, if we blame the virologists, you know, um, it will never happen again if we just stop gain of function research. And then, you know, listening to you, it makes clear, look, there's, there's an overabundance of risk and we are not tackling any of those fronts. We, we, we are clowning around doing other stuff. We also don't have enough collaborations between ecologists and virologists. So understanding how these species interact with environments is going to be crucial. Understanding what the right questions are is crucially important. And I mean, I've worked with virologists more than I imagined I would over the last few years. Um, not only do they not know how to identify or handle bats, and you're like, if you hold them like this, you will stress them out. You probably don't want to stress out these animals if you can help it. Um, how also, how best is it to hold a bat, Alice, so that anyone, if uh, if they end up doing that, if the situation so, arises, with a bat researcher. Um, so you'll see photos where people are holding up the bats by like I've by seen their like thumbs. holding it by the wings. Just, just I mean, would you like to be held by like no. that? Like, you're putting horrible, a massive yeah. amount of pressure on joints that are not built that way and if they fly because they're stressed then they can break limbs it's not sensible so when we hold bats we generally if it's a small insectivorous bat we will pinion them so you're holding their elbows behind their backs and it means that because their necks aren't flexible enough they can't bend around to bite you yeah. um some will try but they don't generally have the flexibility for some of the fruit bats, you can scruff them, though we prefer not to. But with this research on SARS-CoV-2, we're typically dealing with insectivorous bats. And so we typically just pinion them and that works pretty well. Um, but we're also asking the right questions. So a lot of researchers over the last few years just wanted to find the next virus closest to SARS-CoV-2 in bats. Yeah. And I'm like, that isn't that useful. Like, we know it's spilled over. Great, let's think about the mechanisms. And that does mean things like looking at how uh, shedding varies with stress and how it varies during hibernation or in breeding, et cetera. Because these are real things that happens and we need to distill those generalities rather than just chasing bat zero. And I guess some of those, some of those studies might even elucidate, you know, some of the things to do with, with SARS-CoV-2 as well. So they're not, even if people are interested in that question, it, it's not necessarily a zero sum game, right? You can Precisely. You can, you can do both. Just stratify the study and then you can do both of those at the same time. But also to me, this singular search for bat zero has prevented us from having the types of dialogue we need to. And is much better to look at collaborations mm -hmm. rather than say, well, it, it's dangerous to do this because we, we need to learn from this pandemic because none of us wants to be our uh, the next generation to be going through these challenges again or us to be going through another lockdown in five in years 10 years down the road yeah i mean at the moment it seems like we are more at risk for sars cov 3 than than we were for sars cov 2 so this is not a good position yeah, we're, to be we're in good at destroying everything and unfortunately as a consequence of the pandemic and global recession many countries have suspended environmental regulations that protected the environment and so rather yeah. than saying hang on a minute us destroying everything was kind of caused this disease which has been massively impactful maybe we should do less of that they've said oh it's expensive let's get money quickly now and we can worry about things later i remember seeing that big paper was it earlier in the year or maybe last year from colin carlson and that, yeah. that group that was basically kind of banging this drum of look climate change habitat destruction these are all things that are going to put us we are in, we are this entering is a really the pandemic good illustration of why you need bat researchers on the paper because mm -hmm. if you had bat researchers that they would have told you that the basic premise of that paper of massive turnover on the chinese boundary was because there was an error in the iucn maps and two groups of bat researchers weren't working together mm -hmm. there's another paper that said the same thing it's like actually no that's just an artifact of the data mm -hmm. and the complete premise of your paper is <laughs> fiction um we need to do better <laughs> some some shades <laughs> shots, shots fired the uh, that, that that raises one question from from what i saw saw yesterday with the the john cohen article so i think and maybe philip you you read this in more detail than me so maybe you want to to kind of follow up on this but they they mentioned something about sampling was it seventy thousand bats and they didn't find any of these uh sars-cov-2 related 
viruses and yet that doesn't seem to square very well with you know going out into the institute and finding four straight away of course this is a statistical sample so maybe there's something going on there or it's different oh. regions that i'm not aware of philip do you want to maybe uh maybe oh, follow right. up on that a little bit you 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 crashed in between a little bit but okay. i think we got it okay. you froze. Right. hopefully not a virus even if <laughs> okay. um so i i I don't trust their work in any way. I, I don't think it's possible to have honestly found that result in any conceivable way, uh, which I said to John. Um, some of their sampling was around species that we know don't carry it. Mm. But at the same time, some of what they stated just doesn't add up. Like they said, oh, we went to Shishongana to sample bats before you before the pandemic. It's like, there's no reason for them to have gone there. There are not big cast extents in that area. So there's literally no plausible region, reason why they would have gone that, into that area in the first place. Um, but also like the Lao study, the studies that have been done in Cambodia, et cetera, it is beyond any question that coronaviruses are circulating in the bats and trying to pretend that they're not is a way to erode trust in science because yeah. it's not realistic, it's not reasonable. And it takes us further away from the solutions we need rather than closer to them. Where, where do you think that sort of, if that if that study is fallacious not uh, and not fully accurate, where, where do you think the, the reason for doing that has come from? Is it, is, is it fear? Is it, is, it, is it direction from on high? What, 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 what are we sort of looking at here in, in well, your opinion? Obviously it's hard, I'm sure it's hard, to, you're not gonna be able to give us a, a concrete well, answer, but, but any insight? If you think about key people who are doing the Institute of Microbiology, et cetera, who lead the CDC, they're not on that paper. They are not reporting that line. I think it is a group of researchers who wanted to make people happy and gain access to funding. And so they wanted to find what they thought would be the most beneficial line to them, which is like, oh, there's no evidence. There is evidence. Um, them either making up data or ch cherry picking the data that was negative, does not mean that there is not significant evidence. We know without question that coronaviruses are circulating the bats and it's ridiculous to say otherwise. So my guess is it was trying to make friends and gain access to funding rather than to do any real science. And I, and I guess you, you sort of raise a very interesting point there. So, so obviously people run off with that article and they say, oh, well, if we can't trust this, what can we trust? Like, can we trust anything that's come out from China? All the recent papers must be rubbish. But you mentioned there a sort of bifurcation where there's a small group of researchers. It wasn't reported by the, the Chinese CDC. You need to be careful who's reporting this. It's not it doesn't necessarily mean throw it's not a monolith. I mean, water. it's not yeah. a, it's not a monolith where you just go, oh, well, bad study here. Everything goes out of the window. That, that That's that's a little bit too much. Is that? Yeah. That and fair? also, I mean, Groups like the Chinese Academy of Sciences, so I work with CAS within China, they had structures in place to basically screen out things that could be an issue. Mm. Um, and that's why people from the Chinese Institute of Microbiology are on most of those papers. So they've had a degree of bet betting. Mm. If it hadn't come through those sources, I would regard it with extreme caution anyway, because mechanisms were developed in early 2020 to basically ensure that erroneous research wasn't going out, at least from CAS. And outside that, it, it has a very wide error bar as to how much trust you can put into it. Interesting. So yeah, I mean, and this is I mean, this is one of my pet issues is like, you know, when politics start interfering with science, everybody's worse off, right? And, and this is true both on the US side where you have, you know, motivated actors, economists like Jeffrey Sachs, you know, just you know abusing scientific systems to to kind of and uh, to to throw doubt on, on on good science and independent scientists in china is the same you have this governmental interference with what can be said you know how funding is attributed if you trot the party line uh if you give coverage for you know it came from anywhere outside of china and and this you know erodes you know the global endeavor that we that we had and we still i think have from many independent scientists working together and trying to get to the truth in order to make good decisions and if we cannot if we if we lose science because of politics then we we have we have we cannot make good decisions anymore globally yeah is that something I mean, that, science is yeah. the basis of everything from what we eat to us not getting sick we need to trust science and we need to protect scientists because i mean 
Eddie Holmes would say as well, like scientists have had a lot of issues through this pandemic and a lot of mud slung at them. But at the end of the day, we are trying to do work that helps conserve the species we care about and make the world a better place. Like there isn't any self-interest there. And I, I hate the degree of deceitful grift that some people have had, which has elevated themselves. And I'm, I'm sure it's made them a buck or so, but it's dangerous and it erodes trust in science and hinders us from developing effective solutions. This is this is where we've sort of been on it on it for a long time. Look, you know, I don't expect everyone around the world to be to be an expert on this on these topics. I certainly am not. And, and, and Philip is not an expert on some of them, but he's, he's far more of an expert than me. But it's the people who should know better who work in these fields and yet throw around, you know, unscientific ideas about conflicts of interest and you know shady backroom deals and these kind of things to elevate themselves which really sort of which really sort of upset us because as you say we're going to need these scientists going forward to uh to do better and to work out how we lower and minimize that risk of a of a of a sars cov 3 yep or whatever else it is it's not as if there aren't other funds yeah exactly i mean we already are in a monkeypox (laughs) pandemic and yeah. God knows what else, Handrise, Nipa. I mean, there's uh, the catalog is endless. So. Yeah, you, you pick one, and yeah. I mean, I mean, we, we very... talked to Carlos, and he was like, "Oh, you know, there's the the Sapia virus." I'm like, "What is that again?" And he was like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, it's like like some an Ebola kind of style, the hemorrhagic fever thing." You know, in the West, mysterious. We don't of... know, and it's like, "Oh, thank you." <laughs> in the West, we're kind of we're kind of insulated, is it? And you you made this sort of you mentioned that the, the kind of One Health, um, Alice. That, yeah. that cultural practices in Southeast China or Southeast Asia, you know, people in Africa building, you know, settlements or eating certain animals, people in the Amazon going into these, these places, that, you know, deforestation yeah. places that they haven't been before. All of these things to us in the West seem, you know, oh, these are local problems to deal with. Why, you know, why w- would people do this? But they can actually have a real impact on our health, as we've seen during this pandemic back in the West. So even if you're looking at it from a, a completely selfish perspective without thinking about the, the welfare of the people in these regions, it's something that we need to get a handle on from a selfish perspective because otherwise it's going to come back to bite us again. We've had two and a half years of massive disruption due to these issues. Yeah, so I mean, monkeypox is an interesting case in point. And what most people listening probably aren't aware is there was an outbreak a few years ago because uh, prairie dogs got imported into the US as pets and basically infected a whole load of rodents in a pet shop and then people got it from them. Um, Mm -hmm. Wildlife trade is a huge issue and it's not just people in Africa eating the local blue dica. Um, A lot of animals that are being imported for pets also come from the wild. So some other unrelated work we did has been looking at legal pet trade of reptiles, amphibians, et cetera. And it turns out that for many of these groups, between 50 and 70% of individuals are coming from the wild. Now, most people don't think when they go to a store and buy an animal that it might have been in a forest a few weeks before and that a lot of its cage mates probably died. But this is a reality. And it spreads diseases that not only impact us, but can also spread to wild systems. And so things like chytrid fungus, which affects amphibian species, are massively spreading. And it's as a consequence of this under-regulated wildlife trade that most people are not aware of. Very, very interesting. So do you want to, do you want to? Yeah. So um, before I give Alice uh, a chance to say what what else might be on her mind, I I, I just try to usually, you know, get get a bit of hope towards the end of the conversation because we learned a lot about problems. We learned a lot about issues. We say a lot about horrible things, things that are coming down the, you know, the path so, next, everything's doom and gloom, but we try and... So, things. but but I, I, I usually think that, you know, people underestimate that also domain experts have a, have a, have a better perspective on what can be done and how much hope there actually is to, to get a handle of these problems. So maybe you can share some of these ideas. Okay. If you have, if you have any. <laughs> so there's a change what's your, what's your roadmap for, for, for us going forward, I guess, yeah. Um, so I think we live in an interesting time. We now live in an era of Zoom, etc., where we can have these global conversations, etc. And I mean, when I first started working in Thailand um, in about 2008, Skype barely existed and wasn't really a thing. 
um, it was very difficult without traveling around the world that you could have these global discussions. And we have them now and we have GenBank, et cetera, so we can share genetic data. Um, the first, I think, uh, genome of SARS-CoV-2 was in January 2020. I think it took 12 years or something to sequence SARS-CoV-1. Like science is moving so much faster than it used to. And that means that from vaccines to understanding the actual spike protein of this virus, we can do it at a rate that was impossible even a few years ago. And so understanding and using that data effectively is critical. But what we can't afford to do is lose the momentum of the fact that every one of us, no matter where we are in the world, has been affected by this virus. And we are going to see more unless we decide to do things differently. And so um, making sure that people are aware of what the issues are and what they as individuals can do. Um, so things like thinking about what people are consuming, et cetera, where it's come from, deforestation free supply chains. I mean, President Macron at the start of the IUCN conference last year, pledged that France would become deforestation free. We can do that. We can use things like Starling verification, remove deforestation from global supply chains. These are things that are possible that aren't before. We can enforce them using remote sensing, which we could not do before. But in order to do that and realize that potential, we need to be responsible and we need to act. And that's something that people still aren't very good at doing. And so from individuals to governments, we need to start actually doing something better. We need to collaborate more we need to stop pontificating and actually take some action and not just wait until someone else does because otherwise we will be experiencing this again okay it, it turned a bit negative towards the end but uh, at least there were some nuggets of, of hope <laughs> in there <laughs> yeah that's 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 the scientific curse you know we always we have to caveat whatever we say whatever <laughs> positive we say we have to caveat with but if we don't if this goes wrong then you know that's normal it's but always a caveat that that's just how life is there's no simple solutions here and ecology itself isn't simple either like yeah. the whole point is that we can't there aren't uh, there aren't any shortcuts here we need to be realistic about what the issues are and what the solutions are. And it's still something that we're lagging behind on. Can you, can you give us uh, one more cool bat fact to go out on? Oh, there, there are lots of cool bat facts. Um, just the next time your listeners see a bat, realize that that bat that is smaller than their thumb might be older than them. And it's almost it, it's highly probable it's older than their kids. Um, <laughs> These are amazing animals and they're something we forget about. So having greater respect for these absolutely amazing animals that live way longer than they should. The only other mammal that lives as disproportionately long are the naked mole rats. And bats certainly are a lot more attractive than the naked mole rat. <laughs> Alice, thank you very, very much. Really, really fascinating. Really, really interesting. And I think I think people will really enjoy that. Is there, is there anywhere that you um, you suggest people go to find out more about the work you're doing about about bat ecology in general that they can uh, well i mean people are welcome to go to my research gate and if they do have questions they can i try to answer my research gate questions so i can send you that uh link i am far too easy to find online you just have to google my name and i come up generally with pictures of me with various bats or other animals because it's always better to hide behind an animal <laughs> um but yeah people are welcome to reach out to me scientists need to be better at communicating because if we don't communicate and if we're not transparent about our work then we rely on other people who probably do a less good job at it and so reach out to the scientists most of us will hopefully be happy to have those discussions and try and take science forward that, that's what we found with 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 most of these discussions to be honest most people are very very happy to uh, to explain their research and try and uh, help people to understand it and you certainly helped us a great deal today. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'll make sure all those links are down down in the description. Philip, anything to, to add before we close? Uh, I'm, I'm very happy. I, I was looking so forward to this conversation because I, I've seen you speak and you you speak so fast. It's, it's, the information density is amazing. So we're like, you know, I, I could probably go on for another hour, but then my head would explode. So it's great. So maybe <laughs> maybe at some point we can make effects on people. Sometimes I speak and there's just a silence and I'm like, 
maybe I said too much. No, no, because you 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 have a good you have a good amount of information density. Also, um, we we did not talk too much about you know the systemic approaches you're taking, and uh, maybe at some point in the future we can come back to that. But for now, I think it was a great conversation, and I'm so happy that you took the time. To talk Most to welcome. Us. You know how to reach me, so if you want to do another right. discussion down the line, then just reach out. We we'll wait for your next uh, Chinese paper that is a bit controversial, saying that Orbi <laughs> is not doing so well. <laughs> I'm good at pointing the finger. People need to be better and more responsible about their science. It has implications. <laughs> All right. Amazing. Thank you very <laughs> much. And uh, thank you, Alice. Have a wonderful uh, afternoon and a wonderful. Uh, yeah, enjoy weekend. Europe while you're here. Oh, I, I am. <laughs> Being able to walk outside without a mask on is great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That is it. <laughs> okay. Well, I will say goodbye for now. And if you do want to follow up on anything, just let me know. Of Amazing. course. Take care. Perfect, Ella. Thank you. Ciao. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.